organized in association with and at the Victoria Memorial Hall. Today's event has been billed as a prologue to the literary meet, sometimes on topics which are poles apart. If today can be termed as a kind of curtain raiser, then from the 25th to the 30th, over six days, you will have endless discussions, very interesting interactive sessions on topics as varied as feminism, identity, satire, real writing and real writing, South Africa post Nelson Mandela, our neighboring countries, our own constitution, war, poetry, Tagore's Nobel's, Nobel Centenary, uh, pink series, pink saris and mofasils, the genius of Satyajit Ray, and a lot of other things to look back and look ahead to. At the very outset, I would like to request Dr. Jayanta Sengupta, the secretary and curator of Victoria Memorial Hall, to welcome the gathering here. Dr. Sengupta, please. Good evening, everybody. My name is John Tushin Gupta, and I am the secretary and curator of Victoria Memorial Hall. And on behalf of everybody in the Victoria Memorial Hall, and also on behalf of my co-host in tonight's event, uh, Ms. Malavika Banerjee, the director of Kalam, I welcome you very warmly to this much awaited prologue to the Kolkata Literary Meet 2014 which we are organizing jointly with Kalam this year. <clears throat> As you can see, although it is called a prologue, it is very much a self-standing event in its own right. And it is our proud privilege to have with us here this evening two of the most distinguished persons to give you a preview of the kind of conversations that the Kolkata Literary Meet is about. Uh, we have, of course, Ms. Jhumpa Lahiri, uh, who is one of the leading luminaries of the Global Republic of Letters, uh, whose work has touched and moved us for well over a decade now, and who <coughs> is going to speak for the first time ever in a, in a literary event in Kolkata this evening. So, and it's all happening here, right here, on these steps, on these grounds. So from this evening onwards, this part of the world will no longer be unaccustomed earth to her. And to engage Ms. Lahiri in a conversation about her work, 
our connection to Bengal and India, and the writing process in general, we have none other than one of the leading historians and public intellectuals of our time, Dr. Rudrangshu Mukherjee, the editor of the editorial pages in the Telegraph, and my former teacher in the University of Calcutta. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us here tonight as we unravel the prologue to the Kolkata Literary Meet 2014. Enjoy the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much, Dr. Jayanta Shengupta. Uh, Dr. Shengupta has already told you briefly about the two protagonists for this evening's event. Uh, trying to introduce Jhumpa Lahiri to this learned audience would be like carrying Coles to Newcastle. We all know that her debut short story collection, Interpreter of Maladies, won the Pulitzer Prize in 2000 for fiction. Her first novel, The Namesake, was made into a successful film. She's a member of the President's Committee on Arts and Humanities, appointed by the US President Barack Obama. And her latest book, Lowland, published last year, was nominated for the Mann Booker Prize and the National Book Award for Fiction. And in conversation with her will be Dr. Rudrangshu Mukherjee, historian, presently editor of the editorial pages of The Telegraph, with institutions like the Calcutta Boys School, Presidency College, Jawaharlal Nehru University, and St. Edmund Hall, Oxford, that were fortunate to have such an illustrious student. Rudrangshu is a debater, moderator, conversationalist par excellence, and has authored quite a few books on historical and socio-political topics. He also has a keen interest and reasonably sound knowledge of Western classical music. May I invite Jhumpa Lahiri and Rudrangshu Mukherjee to join us here on the podium, please. <laughs> Accompanying them is Ms. Malavika Banerjee, as you all know, one of the moving spirits behind the Kolkata Literary Meet. And as in most cases, it's always a last minute decision as to who will take the left chair and who will take the right one. Before I hand over proceedings to Rudrangshu Mukherjee, for the next 50 minutes or so, I shall leave you with Jhumpa Lahiri and Rudrangshu Mukherjee for what promises to be an extremely interesting session of exchange of thoughts, ideas, experiences, and hopefully some sparks as well. Now, before we get going, let me thank all of you in the audience for sparing valuable time to be here and making yourself incommunicado for the rest of the world for the next hour or so. A rather difficult proposition nowadays when we are so accustomed to work, live, eat, sleep, and even breathe with our vibrant cell phones. Over to Rudrang Shamukaji. Good evening. Uh, welcome to Calcutta Jhumpa. Thank you. And I hope this is the first of many conversations that you'll have with readers in this city of your work and other works of literature. Uh, I should also perhaps say welcome home. Thank you so much. I'm so honored uh, to be here. You know, Calcutta has been most vividly present in the latest novel of yours. But many of us have felt that in some of your short stories and your novels, Calcutta is a presence, is an absent presence at times. Uh, would you like to comment on that? Would you agree with it? I, I do agree. I think um, Calcutta has been exactly that all my life, an absent presence in my life, and occasionally it was a present presence when we would come, but uh, the majority of my conscious life and my upbringing certainly was shaped by and informed by the absence of this city and what that absence meant to my parents and how it affected them emotionally and how it uh, not only affected them, but um, the many, many people they befriended in um, 
first in England and then in the United States. So um, it was always uh, it was always there, but it was also not not there. And so I think that tension, that uh, that contradiction in terms, is something that's very much in my blood and um, and all of my writing <clears throat> until now certainly has come out of that uh, trying to understand how and why a place can have such a powerful hold on a lot of people and I think that fascinates me particularly because I, per I personally don't feel any connection uh, like that. I don't have any singular connection to, to one place or to one country. I don't feel like I come from any specific place. Um, but I was raised by two people who uh, not only do come from a specific place, but keenly felt uh, the absence of that place as they were raising me. So. I think it's sort of ine inevitable that that would uh, that would begin to uh, inspire the writing. So this yearning for Calcutta that you kind of imbibe from your parents is it a kind of cultural memory for you? Do you see it as part going back very far in your childhood, which has formed you in cultural terms? I mean, certainly from my earliest memories, among my earliest memories, uh, Calcutta is there. I was, I was raised in a sort of double world, uh, raised in the United States for the most part, but always going back and aware of the coming and the going and the back and forth. And when did you first come to Calcutta? Do you have a memory of that? When did you first come I to first Calcutta? I first came when I was two. I don't have a memory of that trip. And then the second trip, <clears throat> uh, I was five. And I, ha I do have some memories of that trip. Um, and then from that, that age, I, I begin to remember, um, you know, quite vividly coming here. And I also remember all of the, the, the plane journey, the great distance, that um, seemed even greater 40 years ago than it does now. Um, I was raised in a very small provincial town in America. Most of the people I went to school with had never ridden on an airplane, you know, and I was... Um, and beginning. probably never heard of Calcutta. Well, they had never heard of it, and those who had heard of it, you know, my some of my teachers, for example, I mean, I. I don't want to belittle them, but um, they were horrified, you know, <laughs> that my parents were taking me here. I mean, their their conception, their misconception, I should say, of what Calcutta was, what it represented. Um, you know, I was very aware of that as a child. I was very aware that um, Calcutta had a certain had a certain reputation in the West, in America especially in small town, provincial America, um, and that it meant quite the opposite for my parents. And for my parents, it was, you know, my mother would go to Calcutta and she would spend a day with her brother on College Street with a list of all of the books she wanted to buy and going to all of the different publishing houses and packing a whole small library in a suitcase to tide her over until the next If I time. remember rightly, so she studied in Calcutta University. She did. She studied literature. And, um, and so I knew that it was a city of uh, enormous artistic heritage, a, a city of poets, a city of writers, a city of musicians, a city of artists. I knew this from, um, from my mother, uh, mainly. Uh, but there was always such a strange disconnect between what I knew and, and, and the Calcutta that my parents were exposing me to compared to the Calcutta that sort of, um, you know, was the unknown, scary city. Um, and I was, I was really struck when I was young by a sort of fundamental lack of curiosity 
um, among, you know, uh, my friends. Um, you know, I would go away sometimes for two months and I, I would miss school and I would come back and nobody ever asked me what I did, what I saw there, how it was. Um, there was a sort of lack of curiosity and I, I found that very troubling because for me, the contrast between the environment in which I was raised in Rhode Island and this environment, I mean, the, the two places really couldn't be more different um, in a certain respects. And so the contrast was profound. And um, <clears throat> I, was, uh, I was struck by it repeatedly, you know. I don't know if, if I'm the only reader who feels like this. I always get the sense when I read your writings that there is an undertow there of melancholy. Uh, I'm, I'm not trying to say there's no humor in, that, in your writing or anything like that, but you know, as the story unfolds, I always get a sense of this poignancy and sadness. Uh, does it come from this, what you called a contradiction or an anomalous, anomalous position? that you are actually, you know of the yearning for Calcutta, but you are not part of it, that Calcutta is an absent presence, if you like, or am I being completely far-fetched? No, no, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I, I'm aware of a sort of melancholic uh, spirit in the work, um, but again, I think, you know, I was raised with a sort of double, La layered yearning. I mean, there was my my parents' yearning for, for Calcutta, which I didn't share, but which I experienced because I was their child. And I that was my world, and that was my reality, was, was with them coming and going and experiencing and witnessing what the coming and going meant. Some of the most traumatic memories I have as a child were the evenings that my parents had to say goodbye to their parents. I mean, those nights were terrifying to me and um, because I would see how devastated my parents were. And, and so I, I would see what a difficult choice they had made. Um, deciding to stay abroad as opposed to coming back here. And that they were very human in their, both their wish to be with their family, with their parents, their brothers and sisters and cousins and so forth, and also their desire for experiencing life in another part of the world and building their life elsewhere. Um, but I, so I was exposed to that. I was exposed to their longing, the melancholy that, that pervades that absence, as you say. Um, and then there was my own longing for a sense of belonging anywhere, you know, but I never found that place. And what does, I was- Does that trouble you? That you don't belong to any particular place? It did, very much, when I was a child. It was, it was a source of constant anxiety that I, was, uh, that I didn't come from any one particular place and that I didn't, there was no place I could go and be completely sort of, uh, that I could identify myself completely with that place. Um, it bothers me much less now and I, now I think of it as a, a certain freedom from belonging. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that now and then I don't have a sort of strange yearning for a belonging in, in any place, you know. Um, now I live in Rome, in Italy, which is a, a country in some sense is similar to India in that it's a very old country and people tend to stay there and families tend to stay together in the same cities and towns they come from. and. And I have many friends now there who, you know, they can go back to their family tree generation upon generation and upon generation and feel a sort of deep-rooted connection to their country. And uh, 
I know that I too have a family tree here, yeah. but I don't, I think fe the feeling of belonging is much more of a psychological feeling. It's not really connected to a reality. And I, saw, I, I know that because my parents have lived outside of Calcutta for almost half a century, but they still feel that in some sense they belong, they belong here. To Calcutta. Yeah. You know, and so when they come back here, they, they, they're coming home. Yeah. And they still refer to it as this, and that that's what it is for them. Mm. Um, so it's more of a state of mind, you know, the sense of belonging. Um, but I never had that. I don't have that. And I, as I said, I was, I was, um, I felt that it was something missing in my life for, um, for much of my life. And then I think um, things began to change when I started writing. Because when I started writing, I felt for the first time, um, whole as a person and I felt that I had a, um, I, I thought of myself as coming from um, other writers who had inspired me and guided me and that gave me a sense of um, 